Peace be to the brothers and sisters, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. From this morning's Gospel reading from St. Matthew chapter 5. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are, so far, the word of the Lord. The public ministry of Jesus begins with his proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. Unlike the religious types and the street side prophets of his day, Jesus' ministry was quite different. Rather than a barrage of doom and gloom or an incessant turn or burn diatribe, Jesus preached gospel. Literally, good news about the kingdom of God. While John the Baptist's message of repentance, confession, and baptism found him surrounded by the crowds, Jesus was hard-pressed by multitudes. And where John's audience was convicted by his preaching, Jesus' hearers were enthralled by the hope that they heard and the healing they witnessed. And wherever Jesus went, people from all over the place, even Gentiles from well beyond the Jordan, were coming. The huge crowds just kept getting bigger as his fame spread. And so it was one day that Jesus tried to create some space and devote some time to the teaching of his disciples. And so he goes up a mountain with the disciples who traveled with him, sat down and began to speak to them. Now, note exactly how the reading describes it. Seeing the crowds, he went up at the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. While my, many other people may have been close enough to listen in, Jesus wasn't addressing them. He was talking to his closest followers to men who had already committed themselves to him. He was going to talk to them about God's kingdom, their place in it, what they would discover about God's gracious movement among his people. Where the inferior kingdoms of sinful men focus on things like duty, honor, and country, the kingdom of heaven focuses on God's grace to us. And the teaching begins not with some exhortation to listen up, but with blessed are, enumerating what have come to be called the Beatitudes. Our text for this morning continues. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So far the word of the Lord. A common mistake people often make is misunderstanding what the Beatitudes are getting at. Some people hear them as Beatitudes. That is, these are the things you need to do to make God happy. Such many folks see these blessing statements as prescribing a Christian lifestyle, describing a conditional relationship with God, a you do this and God will do that response. And perhaps if Jesus were on that mountain addressing the crowds as a new Moses or as a reincarnated prophet Elijah, that could be the proper understanding. But as we noted earlier, Jesus isn't addressing the crowd. He's teaching his disciples. And not only that, 
The very words Jesus used are not stated as imperatives. They're not commands. Jesus calls his believers blessed. Those are indicatives. It indicates their status. It's a factual statement that those who are following Jesus are blessed by God's choosing, not their doing. What Jesus describes as not the expectations of God for men, but the values his kingdom demonstrates before the eyes of men. That Jesus undertakes this teaching his disciples what life in God's kingdom looks like. In today's intro from Psalm 15, David reflects the idea of godly values being lived out by godly people. He writes, O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue, does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against a friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change, who does not put out money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. And while David is listing all kinds of actions on the part of God's people, what he's really describing is the attitude of God's people, of their living out God's kingdom values. The Old Testament reading from Micah ends with a very similar thought where he says, He has told you, old man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. This reflects the faith life principle of discipleship that Jesus establishes when he was asked to declare the great commandment of the Lord, which he does, basically teaching us to what? Love God, love others, repeat. For disciples, the law becomes a guide for living of how we praise the Lord who by grace is our light and salvation, of whom shall I be afraid? The Beatitudes are indicative. They state how God values his kingdom and how those values are lived out by his people. The poor in spirit are those who empty themselves before the Lord. That is, they are not so full of themselves with their pride and their arrogance or self-importance that there's no room for God. To those who are empty of their own sinful self, God pours his grace into their hearts. Thus theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Not a maybe, not a something to come way off in the future, but a right now status confirmed on them by God. Those who mourn are people who have a sense of compassion for what's going on around them. They recognize the effect of sin on the world, mourning both what has happened to them as well as what they've done to others. And God promises the comfort of their souls, which only he can give and does give through the forgiveness of sins that flows from his grace. The meek are not weak, as some surmise, but they are people who are self-controlled, living with a gentle spirit, which the Greek word praeus implies. You see, they look beyond themselves to the needs of others. And because their gaze is beyond themselves, they see the providence and the caring of God the Father in creation. And so to them, God gives the earth. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are people who are looking for something new, better than a life marked by sin and misery and regret. Their eyes are open, searching for the signs of God's grace, and their hearts yearn for him. Their longing is reflective of the words from Psalm 42, where David says, As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. Satisfaction is the promise for their yearning. The merciful are those who deal with the people around them sympathetically rather than judgmentally. 
Instead of being arrogant toward others, the merciful humbles them, themselves. They know that they too are sinners, and that without the grace of God in the redeeming work of Jesus, they also would face condemnation. But instead, God promises that they will find mercy before his judgment seat. The pure in heart are people of integrity who strive to do the right thing for the sake of God's glory. When Jesus will later teach his disciples, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven, well, such pure in heart people are those of whom he is talking. They are promised a glimpse of God even as they have given glimpses of him to others through their faithful words and deeds. Peacemakers, well, they're literally people who work for peace among men. The word peace in the Greek, charis, is used in the same manner as the Hebrew word shalom, which is not merely the absence of evil, but as having a concern for the well-being of others, of seeking others' highest good. Followers of Jesus work for peace in the manner of their master, the Prince of Peace, who in return calls them sons of God, a title only God himself can bestow. God calls them sons as they walk in his spirit in their peacemaking. Those who are persecuted are blessed because they're willing to suffer for doing the right thing. And likewise, those who are reviled and persecuted on account of following Jesus as their master are promised the kingdom of heaven and all its great rewards. Whatever the world may take away from them will be more than made up for in their heavenly possessions to be received. Rejoice and be glad, Jesus says, for there is blessing in going through all of our experiences as, what, as we do so in fellowship with him. The kingdom of heaven is different from all the kingdoms of the earth. Its values are placed into the hearts of believers to be lived out in their lives as the blessed children of God. The attitudes of the faithful become the motivation for their actions as they live as followers of Jesus, their Lord and Savior. Blessed are you, not because of what you do or don't do, but because of God who chooses to bless the sinful children of men with mercy and salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. And while this may not make sense to people, it's the way God rolls. Even as St. Paul declares in this morning's epistle from 1 Corinthians, for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews, folly to the Gentiles, but to those who were called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The kingdom of God is so different that Jesus decided to go up a hill and when he sat and his disciples came to him, he taught them all about it with his words, Blessed are you. May their lessons learned become ours by faith so that we too can rejoice and be glad. And all God's people said, Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus unto life eternal. Amen.